Today on Blue 58, we take a look at the Packers' next opponent, the Philadelphia Eagles. They come to Lambeau Field Thursday night. Didn't we just preview a game? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast to thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for, yes, another preview. These Thursday games are kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, it's, it's frustrating for the players. It's frustrating, I think, for fans sometimes just because Thursday night is not... Uh, it's not the easiest time to watch a football game. It's right smack dab in the near middle of your week, and it really can screw up your Friday sometimes. But here we are. We'll all get through it together. It's the 3-0 and Packers against the Philadelphia Eagles, who are 1-2 and on Thursday night. And I'm not sure which of those records is more of a surprise. But this is the time of the year when you really start to get to know what these teams are really all about. Way, 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 way way back. There's like five listeners who are even going to know about this, but way back in the Packer perspective days, Google that and see if anything comes up. uh, I wrote about how an NFL season is a lot like a five act play. You've got four easily dividable chunks in the regular season. And then if you're lucky, you've got the postseason too. five different acts. I don't count the preseason in there, but in a play or in a book, Anything that has five chunks, you're going to spend the first part of that on exposition. You're getting to know the characters. You're getting to know their motivations. You're getting to know what they can do and what they can't do. And for most of the NFL, we're still in the exposition phase of the 2019 story. Let's put it that way. Story, not play, not book, just a story. Who are these teams? What are they good at? What makes them tick? What makes them go? What makes them work? What makes them not work? We're figuring that out about the Packers. We're figuring that out about the Eagles and every other team that they're going to play this year. And every other team in the NFL is figuring that out about themselves and about the rest of the teams in the league. Now, some of them have it figured out pretty well so far. The Patriots seem to know what they're about already. Their defense is as good as any defense we've seen in a long, long time. Their offense is still going to be Tom Brady-centric, not making mistakes, taking advantage of whatever the defense doesn't do super well. For most of the rest of the league, they're still trying to figure out their identity on both offense and defense. And I think that brings us to the Packers and Eagles this week. If you look at our data, our tail of the tape data, the few categories that we look at every week, there's not a lot that jumps out about either team. Through three weeks, the Eagles have a top 10 scoring offense. That hasn't meant a lot for them because they're still one and two. Their offense does put up some pretty good yardage numbers, but not great. They're about 13th in the NFL, 13th in particular, I guess, exactly 13th. Uh, And by the Football Outsiders DVOA metric, they're 11th. But much like the Packers, there's not a lot that really jumps out about anything they've done so far. And so a lot of those numbers are fair to Midland. Their defense is not super great either so far through three games. The Packers, we all know the story there. Their offense hasn't been super spectacular. Their defense has been about as efficient as it gets. And I think if there's any strong identity in this game so far, it's that Packers defense. Outside of that, it's hard to tell, it's hard to really hang your hat on anything concerning either of these two teams. Let's look at the quarterbacks for a second. The numbers for Carson Wentz and Aaron Rodgers, too, look like two guys still figuring it out this season, still coming into form. Carson Wentz had a great game in week one, kind of backed off a little bit in week two. In week three, uh, just good enough to put up some good numbers, not good enough to beat the Detroit Lions. They had a shot there at the end, and I'm not, I'm still not sure if Rashawn Melvin made a great player. The Philadelphia Eagles made a, uh, had a drop there by a receiver there right at the end of the game. But it looked like the Philadelphia Eagles had a chance to win a game they probably shouldn't have been in. But they didn't, and so they're one and two. The bottom line, I think, for both Wentz and Rodgers is that neither quarterback is really playing their best football right now or hasn't so far this year. But but that could change. That could change pretty easily this week. Thursday night games, kind of all the bets come off. You're never really sure what to expect, but there are some good reasons to think that this game could favor the Packers a little bit. We'll talk about that in a second. 
When it comes to players to watch for the Philadelphia Eagles, you got to start with their defense, I think. Because while Carson Wentz is fun, while their wide receivers like Deshaun Jackson and Alshon Jeffrey are fun as well, even they, they've even got a fun rookie running back in Miles Sanders to watch. Their defense is what makes them go. I think that's been the driving force for their success the last couple of years, and I don't think that's a super controversial opinion. They've got a bunch of good pass rushers up front, not as many as they used to and not as many as they could have with Malik Jackson injured, but they do have a pretty good defensive front. And the best of the bunch is Fletcher Cox, 6'4", 310 pounds. He's in his eighth year in the NFL. He's been to the Pro Bowl each of the last four years, was an All-Pro in 2018. Here's how good Fletcher Cox is. Since 2010, there have been three players, three seasons, excuse me, combined by two players from the defensive tackle spot in which that player has compiled at least 10 sacks and at least 30 quarterback hits. Two of those three seasons were Aaron Donald, once in 2015, the other in 2018. The other player to put up those numbers, Fletcher Cox. Last season, he had 10 and a half sacks and 34 quarterback hits. That's a pretty busy season from a defensive tackle. And it could be a busy Thursday for him going up against rookie Elton Jenkins and Billy Turner, who, depending on who you ask, might be either the best pass-blocking guard in the NFL or one of the best or one of the worst. This is where we circle back to that idea of teams and players still figuring out who they are. According to ESPN's pass-block win rate, Billy Turner is a top-five pass-blocking guard in the NFL. But according to Pro Football Focus, who also grades every play, he is near the bottom of the league, very, very, very far down the chart, not putting up such strong numbers in pass protection. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I Just looking at him, Billy Turner so far this season has looked like a pretty middle-of-the-road offensive guard, the one part of the Packers free agent class that really hasn't looked like a home run so far this season has to be Billy Turner. But at least somebody out there thinks he can do a pretty good job. And he'll be battling Fletcher Cox along with Elton Jenkins and, of course, Corey Lindsley as well this Thursday night. That's going to be a key matchup to watch. Let's rewind the clock to the last time the Packers and Eagles played. November 28, 2016. The Packers would win this game in what would turn out to be the first of six straight wins to close out that year. Yes, this was the first game of the running of the table. Ultimately, running the table was just a fun story that probably just extended the Mike McCarthy era by a year and a half or so because really as fun as running the table was and getting all the way to the NFC Championship game, that probably shouldn't have been in uh, a contending Packers team. They got really hot at a good time and made some noise in the playoffs, uh, all thanks in large part to Aaron Rodgers. Their defense was was not really good enough to power them to an NFL championship unless they played their absolute, absolute best. And I, I think that was a little bit much to ask of that group. So I don't want to look at that game just for the outcome of the game. Though it was a nice Packers win. 27-13 to 13 the final. Aaron Rodgers, a, a fairly efficient game. Uh, but what I would like to look at, just for a second, is some of the notable names on the Packers' defense that day. Like I said, the 2016 Packers' defense was not a lot to write home about. But they did have some notable names. Clay Matthews, Mike Daniels, Nick Perry, and Julius Peppers each had sacks for the Packers. Dayton Jones had a quarterback hit that day. Haha, ha, Clinton Dix had an interception. Micah Hyde, Morgan Burnett, and Demarius Randall all had tackles that day. Even Carl Bradford had a tackle. Uh, his lone tackle on defense from his entire time in Green Bay. But today, less than three full years later, all of those guys are either on a different team, a free agent, or out of the league entirely. Clay Matthews is off with the Rams. Mike Daniels looks like he's not going to be playing a whole lot with the Detroit Lions. Nick Perry, a free agent. Julius Peppers, retired. Dayton Jones was in Jacksonville last I saw. Ha ha, Clinton Dix playing for that team in Chicago. And Micah Hyde, Morgan Burnett, and Demarius Randall all playing well for their respective teams. Uh, Hyde in Buffalo, Burnett, and Randall in Cleveland. The NFL, like I wrote in the piece at thepowersweep.com, really does stand for not for long, more often than not. Even though those guys, most of them are still playing, things can change 
so quickly. So who's going to win this time? That was 2016. This is 2019. Who is going to come out on top? Packers, Eagles, Thursday night. On paper, the Eagles seem like they're a better team. I think they probably have a slightly better roster, at least on offense. Maybe it's about even on defense from what we've seen from the Packers so far this year. So on paper, it looks like the Eagles might have a bit of an advantage. But their injury report is about a mile long. And this comes back to something that I've brought up a few times this season already. Sometimes games aren't so much about who you play as when you play them. And with the Eagles really banged up right now, coming into a Thursday night game on the road, this may be about the best time you could hope to play the Eagles. Maybe later this year, maybe in the playoffs, it's not quite such a good time. They're a little bit healthier. They have a little bit more of an identity established on offense or on defense or both. Maybe they're a tougher matchup at that point of the year. But now, I'm not sure that the Packers don't have a bit of an advantage here. Playing at home is a big benefit in these Thursday night games. In fact, road teams are just 28 and 45 in Thursday night football games since 2015. Coupled with that fact, you've got just a few unknowns here. You've got the Packers offense on, on Green Bay side is, is a little bit of an unknown at this point. What are you going to get from them on a weekly basis? Are you going to get a quarter, a half, a full game? Who knows? But also unknown is how the Eagles injuries are going to shake out between now and Thursday. Their defense, too, hasn't been especially special this year. On the flip side, there are a few known quantities in this game. Carson Wentz, though he's been up and down this year, is a known quantity. He's been fairly good so far in the NFL. I'd say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek. He's been pretty good. Uh, pretty good to great, in fact. The Packers' defense, too, seems like a pretty known commodity, as does Miles Sanders on the Philadelphia Eagles' offense. The strongest of those known commodities, and the most notable of all those things that we've looked at, is probably the Packers' defense. And given the struggles that road teams seem to have on Thursday night football, I'm going to go with that known quantity of the Packers' defense, and I'll take the Packers to win 24-20 to on Thursday night. This week, the voters are on the same page with me, or I am on the same page with the voters. A fairly significant 89% of the voting populace in our weekly Twitter poll said the Packers were going to win this week. That's pretty confident. The second highest total so far this year. 96% of voters thought they'd beat the, the Broncos last year. In general, people are still feeling pretty good about this Packers team. 97% of voters uh, think that the defense is doing a job, a heck of a job right now. They approve of the job that the defense is doing. But even that number pales in comparison to the current approval rating of one Mike Pettin. For the first time in the history of our poll, someone has a perfect number. 100% of voters this week say they approve of the job that Mike Pettin has done. No neutral votes. No votes of disapproval, 100%. That's pretty exciting. That's pretty interesting, too, and it'll be interesting to see how that changes over the course of the year because I don't think it's going to stay at 100% over the course of the rest of the season. Elsewhere in polling data, Brian Gutekunst gets a big jump this week. We wondered last week if people were a little bit down on him for not being aggressive, pursuing uh, Minka Fitzpatrick or Jalen Ramsey. That seems to have been forgotten this week. The number up to 95% approval this week. Matt LaFleur also rounding into form a little bit. People are starting to make up their minds about him. 70% of voters, same as last week, uh, say they approve of the job he has done as the head coach so far. Not too bad for LaFleur. But the offense as a whole still remains a bit of a mystery to voters. 13% only approve of the job the offense has done so far this year. I think that's understandable, but interesting too. Because another 69% of voters say they are unsure of what to think of the offense. They're offering neutral votes. That's much the same uh, with Aaron Rodgers. As well, just 26% of voters approve of the job he's done so far this year. 59%, up from even the very high number of 50% last week, 
say they have a neutral opinion of the job that he's done so far this year. This These are remarkably low numbers for Aaron Rodgers. In fact, by far the lowest we've seen for him over the time that we've done this. Uh, he was down uh, to 24% two weeks ago, which was you know, pretty bad as well. Uh, but prior to this season, it's never been below 48% approval for Aaron Rodgers. That was the low point of last season as well. Uh, in, in a season where there's a lot of low votes for, for people across the Packers organization. Uh, this could be the turning point for him. I would hope that it is. Uh, I would love to see a Packers offense that looks a little bit more put together. Hopefully, that's what we get. One last thought before we're done here. Listener Rudy offered this question on Twitter after our recap um, in which we mentioned that the Packers script seems to be a bit of a problem. So the Packers script out 20 or so plays and they seem to have done pretty well in those 20 plays in each of the games they've played so far this season, except for the Bears game. So two of the three games they've done pretty well on the script. So Rudy asks another good question. By the way, we should ask we could, we should call Rudy Rudy the good question asker because this is the the question he asks. Rudy says, "Exclude excuse the Seinfeldian. Why don't they just make the whole plane out of the black box? But if the first twenty plays being scripted works, but the Packers offense doesn't work beyond that, why doesn't Lafleur just script the entire game?" Very fair question, and I think there are two good reasons why a coach might not want to script the entire game. First and foremost. It takes a lot of time to script out those 20 plays. We've referred to this article a couple times, but there's a great piece that Rob Domofsky did this summer about the process of coming up with that script of 20 or so plays. It's not always 20. It may not be, it may never be 20. It could be 15. It could be longer than 20. It could be 25. 20 plays is the the ballpark figure that Matt LaFleur puts on it. And he says it takes multiple days and multiple meetings with Aaron Rodgers over several days of practice to put together that 20-play list. A full game could be 60 plays. It could be 75, 80 plays. And it's doubtful that doing that much work is going to make your offense that much better because, secondly, and more importantly, coaches just rarely use that entire script. Lafleur himself said he didn't need rarely gets through his full 20 plays. He didn't in week one. He was getting, he was into very quickly what he calls his back on track plays and game situations frequently prevent coaches from getting through their script. If you've got a run play up next in your script and suddenly you're facing a third and eight, well, it'd be silly for you to run an off tackle play in that situation. The point of this entire exercise isn't to have a list of plays that you're going to run though. The point is to make sure that everybody on the offense, especially the quarterback and the play caller, is on the same play or on the same page with what you're looking to do with your offense. Domofsky quoted Steve Young from a different article in that article about LaFleur, saying of Bill Walsh, um, their purpose for scripting plays. Quote, its primary purpose was to put people on notice the night before. This is what we're doing. This is where we're headed. These are the things we're going to be dialing up. It just got people focused on tactics and a play, end quote. You're just trying to get everybody organized. However, even if you don't script out an entire game, because that would be hard to do and time intensive, and it may not be a good return on investment, I have seen people throughout the world of football, talk about scripting plays for various points of a game. So maybe you have a second half script of five plays or seven plays that you run to help you get on track for your first drive of the second half. Now, again, there are some issues with that because say you get down 10 points at the half and you're, you come out of the second half and your opponent receives the kickoff and goes down and kicks a field goal, 13 points, or they go down and get a touchdown. Suddenly you're down 17 points to start the ha- second half. Are you going to want to use most of your first drive in the second half on run plays just because that's what you scripted out? Probably not. But there's could be scenarios throughout the game where it would be useful to have some of these more packaged things that the Packers could turn to if things aren't going so well. I think that's part of the reasoning behind the wristband for Aaron Rodgers, and that could be something they want to explore uh, expanding a little bit in the in the weeks to come. I still think it's a little bit too early to get super worried about what the offense is doing. Uh, they're still figuring this out. They're they're looking for their identity. They're just trying to figure out 
what the game process is going to be like. An analogy that has been helpful for me in the past is, is moving into a new house. Now, if you're like me, you get up in the middle of the night. I'm doing this a lot with a, with a, a little kid now. You're up in the middle of the night a lot, or you're just walking around your house in the dark. Chances are you don't have to have a ton of lights on. You know where everything is in your house. You know where the furniture is, and you're not bumping into stuff in the night unless you're really dazed and confused because it's 2.30 in the morning, and this is the third time you've already been up tonight. You know where those things are. It's second nature for you just walking around your house. In a way, I think being a play caller in football is a lot like walking around your house in the dark. If you're new to that house, you're going to walk a little bit more slowly, going to be a little bit more tentative, and you might bump into things a little bit more often. But once you've been there for a while, you don't even have to look. You can just walk around the house and be confident of where you're going. That is kind of the stage where Matt LaFleur is hoping to get to. He still might be bumping into the walls a little bit here, and maybe scripting out some stuff is is going to help him with that. I don't think uh, they have to worry about it a whole lot for right now, although the, the Packers getting off script and not succeeding once that script is over is a little bit of a concern. Hopefully it'll get better as the Packers just get more comfortable in this offense and as they figure out who needs to be a part of it moving forward. That's all I've got for you on this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed Thursday night football, staying up late, wrecking your Friday. Yeah, it'll be a good time. Uh, If you like what you heard, want to support the show, leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you happen to get your podcast. If you want to take your support to the next level, check out patreon.com slash thepowersweep. A dollar a month there helps offset some of our costs, and you will get access to exclusive monthly content from myself and Gary uh, as we work through some stuff. Uh, That is just for our Patreon listeners. And if you want to look good while supporting the team, check out our Teespring store by clicking the shop link at thepowersweep.com. We do appreciate your support, even if it's in something uh, just as simple as a question, a comment, a little bit of feedback, wherever you would happen to give that, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, email, whatever. Uh, get in touch with us because that helps us further our mission of making everybody smarter Packers fans. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans. And better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meernick. We will see you next time on Blue 58.